Thank you, Nicole. Good morning, church. It's good to see everyone here this morning. There are a few announcements that we have. Um, I know Sarah's got one. Wait, just a second. Sam's got to get it on. Good morning. There we go. I am very excited. Um, I'm making this announcement for Ann Parker, who was in charge of the Bible school. And our Tower of Babel went to the community um, crisis. crisis center um, on Monday. And we had 203 pounds of food and paper products. Um, 130 pounds of food and 73 pounds of paper products, and they were thrilled with it. So it was really fun to be able to take it and um, know that it's going to a good place. Thank you so much for all your donations. So that was our Tower of Babel, in case you were wondering where that was at. Melody. Think about want to pray for two people. We want to pray for my sister, that I swear that she had surgery for, like, her back. That's a few good so she had surgery for her back. And for my Aunt Marilyn, because she had a stroke. Okay, we'll pray for your aunt and your sister. Yep. All right. And I believe Kay has some friends who are going to do an announcement for us. Kay, as you know, and this is Jesus, the flood director, and we are all on the Clean Flood Bucket Team. That's a team that was developed by the conference to collect cleaning supplies for families in Iowa that have been affected by tornadoes, fires, and floods. And we are collecting items here at St. Mark's. Julie, you came to the first bucket meeting. Why did you come to that meeting? I wanted to know what a flood bucket was. <laughs> and what did you find out? That it was to help people in crisis that uh, are probably at one of the lowest points in their lives, and I want to be a part of that. Awesome. The flood bucket team decided that we would have a goal of 20 buckets. That's a lot of stuff. As you can see, here are the buckets. Here's some of the stuff. Look, there's all sorts of stuff. So, what means the most to me about the missions of the church is not just throwing a check in the offering plate, but actually doing something, like going to the store, picking up several of these items, putting it in my cart, buying them, and then bringing them to church to share. But I can't imagine we've got a whole 20 buckets full of stuff. Putting it all together. Bart, I understand you've been involved in a congregational project. Yeah, the, uh, the first time we sat down to talk about this, uh, this project, I instantly flashed back to a memory of a project we had at a church we were attending uh, several years back. And what we were doing was we walked in that Sunday morning and we were asked to participate in the development of care packages for inmates over the holidays, okay? And we were asked to go through a list of supplies, follow some instructions, and build those packages together. And, you know, I remember that that morning very vividly where we packed uh, some, some devotional books and some, some Bible passages and some, uh, some notes about the church and how they could attend. And we put that all into, into a, uh, a small brown lunch bag, a paper bag. And we stuck in that bag a small note that was 
Once we got done with that, uh, uh, we walked out of there and said, you know, and that was amazing. And the fact that we did it, and why was it amazing? One was that um, we had a shared purpose. We were helping somebody like you who said the lowest spot. And then the second thing was we did it together. And we met people we didn't know to spend time. So I hope that you come this Sunday and that you spend time and you can join us and still make it because you spend time. Sometime in September, so watch your newsletter and your bulletins for a date. Um, but we want everyone, no one, it will be left out if you can't stand and walk. We'll have sit down things that you can go to to prepare this. So keep bringing your items. There will be a on the poster, take one, put it in your purse or billfold, so when you go shopping, you can pick up an item. So, come join the rest of us. And, well, everybody that's on the bucket team, please stand up. Boyd, you're on the bucket team. Stand up. <laughs> okay, these people can answer any questions that you have. Okay? All right, thank you. Thank you, Kay. It's great to see missions happening again and opportunities for everyone to get involved without just writing a check because there is something about, you know, when you purchase that one, even if it's just one item, you're thinking of the family that may be using it. And you can say a quick prayer for them and uh, it's a way of, of connecting. Are there any other announcements? Just a reminder, Reverend uh, Gillespie, Harlan is going to be here next Sunday um, to worship with you and lead worship. And then the following Sunday, Lynn isn't here, but Lynn and Nancy, right, Nancy? They're doing the worship service, and they're going to give you the annual conference report. So if you want to know what happened at annual conference, they're going to tell you. So if there are no other announcements, I invite you to stand and greet each other with peace of the Lord be with you. I invite you now to join with me in our call to worship. Lord, we breathe in your Holy Spirit and are ready for what's next. When we say yes to you, Lord, open our minds to clear understanding of what that really means. I invite you now to stand if you are able and join with us in our opening song, O Spirit of the Living God.
I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. We have kids of all ages, so everybody's welcome to come. Good morning. How are you this morning? You ready for school? You've got a big year this year, don't you? The school is over there. Yeah? What, what grade are you going to be in? You're going to be in kindergarten, aren't you? Or first grade? First grade? All right. That's exciting. You're going to learn all kinds of stuff. And I'll bet you're going to be able to go out on recess and run some races. You think? Run some races with your friends? No? Wow. I'll bet you will. You might even get roped into doing a three-legged race. Do you know what that is? That's when you and one other person have to run together, side by side, holding on to each other. Legs, one leg is tied to the other person, and you've got to run together. That's fun? Yeah? You like that? Yeah? So what if we did a, spirit, did a practice one today? You want to do a practice one? All right. Jesus is your partner. So can you stand up for me? And come over here? Oh, well, come on. You're not that bad. If we went for all these people, come here. Come here. All right. So, now the way this would work, if you and Melanie were running this race together, your legs here would be tied together and you'd have to walk together. But Jesus is your partner today. Okay? So, Melanie, you can sit down. You can sit down. So, if Jesus is your partner, where is he? Do you know? I bet you do. Where's Jesus? Think about it. In your heart. Absolutely. So how can Jesus run a three-legged race with you? Oh, I don't know. It's going to be a trick, isn't it? Because it'd be really interesting if I tied your leg to Jesus' leg, even though we can't see Jesus, but we know Jesus is there, and all of a sudden you take off running, do you think you win? I bet you would, because Jesus is right there with you. Okay, you have to sit down. <laughs> so last week we talked a little bit about running a three-legged race, and we had to somebody that we had to trust. Well, the person we're running a three-legged race with today is Jesus, right? Yeah. And even though we we can't physically see Jesus, we know Jesus is there. And when Jesus is there, and we walk with Jesus, and we run with Jesus, who wins the race? Jesus, right. Jesus wins the race. So that's what we're going to talk about today. How does Jesus help us win the race? Okay? And how does Jesus walk with us on the journey? Okay? So you always know that Jesus is right where? Over there? Right in your heart, absolutely. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we give you thanks for today. We give you thanks for walking with us, beside us, in us, all around us. For we know that all we do is because of you. And with you at our side, we know life will be good. This is our prayer. We pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming up. At this time, I believe we have some special music, and our special music comes from Jay himself.
Jay, that was one of my dad's favorite songs. Thank you. This is the time in our worship service in which we uh, receive our morning offering. It's also a time in which I invite you to be in prayer with God. This is your time of just sharing with God whatever it is that's in your heart. Let us receive our morning offering. Oh, holy God, the things that you have given us this past week, the strength, the courage, the hope, the love, whatever it is that we needed, you were there. Today we give, it, give you thanks. We also give you thanks for just everything in life. And we lay our gifts on this altar, the gift of our hearts, the gift of our minds, our souls, gift of our hands and our feet and our voice in the world, that we may go out and continue to share the good news of who you are. And all we ask, Lord, is that you accept these gifts and shower your blessings upon them, that as we use them, there are others who will come to know you as you do, who will come to worship you, who will come to learn from you. You will come to be a disciple and to make yourself. This is our prayer. We pray it in your holy name and in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, some of the prayer requests that I have for us today. Um, word came to me that Sue Collins, who used to be a member here, uh, just passed away yesterday, so I have no further details. Uh, you'll have to find those on your own, but continue to keep that family in your prayers as well. Today, we're also continuing to pray for our bishop, our cabinet, our district superintendent, and the North Liberty United Methodist Church as we, uh, as our circuit church for this week. Uh, there are other prayer requests that I'm sure that uh, you have in your heart that you can lift up at this time as well. Let us join God in prayer. Oh, holy God, we sit in this place called the sanctuary, a place where we can find rest, a place where we can find you where we can breathe in your spirit and breathe out the burden. And although we can't quite let them all go, you breathe in your courage, your love, your support. 
Lord, it's not just for us that we come. There are things that are happening all over this world. There are constant reminders of the lack of your, your presence. Not that you're not there, but lack that we, we see it, we witness it, we acknowledge it, we bring it with us. So today, Lord, we come to you in preparation of your message to hear your words that then we penetrate our hearts and our lives so that we can be that voice and those hands in the world, continuing to share the news of who you are and share the power and authority that you give us in your presence in this world. Oh, Holy God, we come to you with humble hearts. We come to you alone. We come to you for healing. We come to you for grace. This is our prayer, Lord. We pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 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 I invite you at this time to stand and join with us in our hymn of preparation, Go Make Talk of All Disciples. Now they 
seven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them, I have received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. The word of God for the people. So last week we talked about the three-legged race, the spiritual three-legged race. Anybody still ready to do that, that three-legged race? I don't know. I don't know. We may have to work on that one a bit. Well, today as we continue to prepare for that race, you know, as I thought about this working on a race, now you'd think it's pretty simple, right? We know the basic concepts. We tie our legs together and we go, right? There's a lot more to it than that. When you think about preparing for one of those races, okay, so you got your, you're ready, you got your legs tied together, and what's the first thing you think of? The end line? Or are you concentrating on how you're going to communicate with your partner and how big a step you're going to take and which leg you're going to start with and how fast you're going to go? You know, there's lots of things to think about as you do this journey, right, to get to the end of the race. So today is the Great Commission, and Matthew's ending is is very interesting for me because we're at the end of the race with Jesus. Now, Mark, Luke, John, they all have Jesus spending time on earth, and they have Jesus doing different things, appearing to different people, talking to different crowds, and spending some time on earth before he ascends into heaven, but not Matthew. So we have to think about the context of the story for Matthew. Now, Jesus has just been arrested. Jesus has been tried. He has been beaten. He has been put on a cross. And he's done. All according to Roman rules, right? Right? Jesus was arrested and tried, and he, all of those things happened, and his death was punishment. Now, remember, Jesus and the rest of the <coughs> those who were on the cross, they were taken to Golgotha, right? Which was one of the highest pinnacles in Jerusalem. And the reason that they took Goliath, or took them to Golgotha, is because they wanted to make a statement to anybody who was coming into the city. The city was overcrowded. With Jesus being there, more and more people kept coming so they could do this sacred, holy festival with Jesus present. And so Golgotha is the place where they all have to walk by. And the Romans wanted to make a statement that you obey the law or this is where you're going to end up. Remember, Jesus was there, Jesus was innocent, and the other two that hung with him were thieves. Simple things, right? They don't deserve that. But this was the Romans' way of making a very loud statement. Only something went wrong. Jesus disobeyed the Romans. He didn't stay dead. Right? So he broke that rule. He broke that law that said, you know, you're going to hang on a cross and you're going to be punished and anybody else who doesn't follow our rules, they're going to get what you got. But they get what Jesus got. That means they continue to live. Okay? So what happens then is the disciples are told to go to the mountaintop, go back to Galilee, go to the mountaintop, where they're going to meet Jesus. And they do Jesus is there. And Jesus tells him that he has received all power and authority 
over the heavens and the earth. Think about that. All power and authority over the heavens and earth. Jesus has fully stepped into his divinity. He is fully united with God. And he stands before them on the mountain. And then he says to them, Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? That's that making of a disciple. So the disciples have now found themselves on a different journey. The person that they trusted that they wanted to run that three-legged race with, Jesus, was the person that they had followed, was the person that taught them everything that they knew. And Jesus also says that I will be with you always to the ends of the earth. Jesus is still going to be there. But instead of Jesus doing the teaching and the preaching and the baptizing and the healing and all of that, guess who gets to do it? Oh, we're quite used to it. Disciples get to do it, right? They're in charge. So now they're to go out and run this spiritual three-legged race with Jesus. It's going to look kind of funny going down the, going down the, the, the road, running this three-legged race with Jesus and not seeing Jesus, right? So that made me wonder, what did Jesus teach the disciples? What did you, has Jesus taught you? We do a lot of conversations around glory sightings and God moments, right? We're, we're talking a lot about that, where God's presence is. But I'm going to change the question up on you, at least for the next couple of weeks. The question I want you to ponder is, what has Jesus taught me? Not what has the pastor taught me. Not what I have learned from the church. What have I learned from Jesus? Because we study the scriptures, right? You've been in conversations about the scriptures, and then when I come back uh, the second Sunday in September, I'm going to start my Bible study class again after coffee time. So we're going to delve into the scriptures and the sermon every week. What has Jesus taught me? The thing that I realized, you know, and part of my reason for going into education was because I wanted to help people learn the things that I learned and they struggle with. And I can remember when I was in sixth grade, there was a kid that always sat next to me and he always struggled with his math and I seemed to get it and I would always go over and help him. That was my first call in education. As I look back in life. And then God says, okay, you'd be good at that. Now, I want you to teach people what they're supposed to know about me. Because you see, Jesus was sending the disciples out. First thing he says is, go and make disciples. Are you a disciple? I'd be one of the first questions I'd ask myself. It's okay, do I define myself as a, as a disciple? If I'm a disciple, what does that mean? What is Jesus? All these years with Jesus, what have I learned? What do I want to emulate of, of Jesus into the world? And then the second question that I would ask myself is, how do I teach that? Sometimes it was just being with Jesus and watching him that you learn. But here's the trick. You want to call it that? Jesus now has all power and authority over heaven and earth. Jesus can give them the power and authority that they need. There's a story earlier where Jesus sends the disciples out in twos. And he gives them power and authority to heal. Preach, teach, heal, cast out demons. 
And they went out in groups of two. They went as a team. And I can't imagine the stories that they would come back with. I mean, I just know in my 30 years of ministry and some of the stories that, that just bring great joy to me, both in education as well as in um, ministry. I can remember I was doing my student teaching. And it was in second grade, one of my favorite grades. We, that was back when they were doing the book of programs. Maybe you guys remember those? Where, you know, you read so many books and then you got the, the personal pan pizzas from Pizza Hut. So that sometimes back. And if everybody in the class turned in their bookets by a certain time, the number of books that they were supposed to read at a certain time, the class got party. Right? We got a pizza party. And then the teacher told me, she said, we never get the party. David never gets this stuff in. So, don't expect it. Well, I knew David's mom. Went to high school with her. And while I didn't talk with her, I just kept encouraging David. You know, I would ask him about it. I would say, what stories have you read? I would encourage him. And I remember I was standing at the desk. I was taking attendance. And here comes the He had the biggest smile on his face. His eyes just glowed. And he walked up to the desk and he said, Here. He was so proud of himself. He got his book at them. He got all of his books read. Right And even though he was the one that was always, always holding up the class, at that time, he still didn't get the party. There was another student that did it. But you know, it didn't matter. David found confidence. David found assurance and hope that he could do something. He didn't have to be the last one. I think Jesus saw that strength in the disciples. Jesus knew that it was time for them to take over. He knew that it was it was their turn to go out into the world and to make just like Jesus has been disciples. So here's a little, a little uh, thing I want you to think about in the next couple of weeks. I'm gone for a couple of weeks. Okay? Yeah, don't worry. All your pastoral care and needs are covered. Something happens. Contact the staff parish member. They know where to go, what to do. But that doesn't mean ministry has to stop. That doesn't mean that you can't plan the next steps of how you want to to help another person discover what it means to be a disciple. Because it doesn't mean that I have to be present. You were disciples. Did you know you were disciples? Has anybody ever called you a disciple before? We often call it church membership. But you're not a member. You are a disciple. And if you've forgotten what that is, it's okay. We got some classes that's going to be later on this fall. We got some classes that you can step into. And they're going to be discipleship classes. And they're going to take us right back to that confirmation class. That what used to be a new member class. To allow you to reset. To allow you to remind yourself of what Jesus has actually taught you. So between now and then, I have another assignment for you to do. Don't you love my assignments? 
see you be working. So here's your assignment. Between now and the time I get back, so the first Sunday in September, I want you to make a list of at least 12 things that you have learned from Jesus. Now, I'm going to give you the first one, so you can't come, you can't use this one on everyone, okay? The first one's a given. We love God, we love our neighbor. Okay? You can't use that language. That's the first one. You can write it down. I'll give it to you. But what else has Jesus taught us? See, it's really easy for us in the church to say, well, all we have to do is love God and love our neighbor. But what does that mean? It's time we go deeper. It's time we start thinking about what did Jesus teach me in the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain. What did Jesus teach me when he turned the tables over to the temple? What did Jesus teach me when he said, let the little children come? What did I learn in the parable where Jesus says to the rich man, give up everything and come follow me? See, those are the lessons that the disciples were given. They were now to take all of those things that they were, were taught everything that they learned from Jesus, and they were to go out into the world and preach and teach so that everyone would know that the power and authority of Jesus, of God, is for life. Now, there's, a little, there's another little caveat to the story. In order for the disciples to go out and do all of this, they had to be able to survive. Because remember, this was at a time where Christians were being executed. There are stories of how Christians had to go out into, and they had to find those safe places where they could talk about Jesus and talk about their faith. And quite often, even worship God deep in the catacombs. had to do it in secret. And now Jesus is saying, I want you to go out and I want you to make it public. So safety was an issue for them. And you know, in some ways, safety is an issue for us as well. How is it, how easy is it to talk politics and religion today? It's not, is it? But the two don't go hand in hand. When we talk about who Christ is for us, who is that partner that walks with us in that three-legged race and carries us to the end, it's about what we've learned from Jesus that seems to be forgotten. Now, there's great faith. There's a lot of things that Jesus taught. So you can really get into some great theological conversation. But I invite you to take the risk. Because I don't know about you, but I think this world needs God. It needs a new understanding. Because, you know, I've had, I've had a lot of people who have come up to me and said, if, I, if I'm not sure if I believe in Jesus, can I come to your church? Wow. My answer, of course, is yes. I believe that there are people who are struggling to find a deep, find a place, let me say it this way, find a place that's safe for them to talk about God, not be preached at, but talk. Where 
where is that safe place that we can go and ask those questions that we've always wondered about? Maybe we find answers, maybe we don't. But where is that safe place? where we can come and find a place to start that deep relationship with God. Because you see, for me, as a disciple, if I'm going to go out and preach and teach and baptize and do all of those things, that's a lot of work. I need a team of people to do it with. But I also need to maintain that relationship with God. I need it to go deeper into that well. Because without God right here by my side, taking every step in sync with me, that's a long journey to walk with. Easy to get lost. It's an important journey. Jesus wasn't ready to give up on the world. He came to save us. Right? That's still the reason Christ came. That hasn't changed. The only difference is you and I are the disciples. You are a student. As a disciple, that's why you come on Sunday morning, right? To learn something. But you are also a teacher. You are also a leader. To open up those conversations where people can feel safe talking to you. And one of the things I always tell people is, I don't have all the answers. I went to seminary for four years, but I don't have all the answers. I used to have a, a church member, her name was Fanson Sin. I've mentioned her before. And she would come up to me after church and she would ask me some question and I'd say, well, you know, I'm not sure I have an answer for that. And she said, well, you went to seminary. You should know. Well, I did go to seminary. We did a lot of classes. God hasn't given me the gift to know everything. That's why we walk together. So while we're partnered with Jesus on one side, we're partnered with each other on the other side. How could we ever lose faith? So remember... The question for you to think about, to ponder the next two weeks is what have you learned from Jesus? And the task is to make that list of things that you've learned from Jesus. Number one, love God, love neighbor. That's a given. But what else have you learned? Now, you can have conversations. You can get a group of people together and talk about this. Yeah, everybody has to come up with their own list. But you can have the same thing on each other's list. You don't have to do that alone. But let's, let's get ourselves grounded in what we've learned from Jesus so that we can start teaching him to others. We're going to get into more things in September um, and October as to what the mark of a disciple is. We're going to delve deeper into that. Because I think it's important for us to know what a disciple is, to identify ourselves as that disciple before we can go make I invite you in this new journey with me. Our end goal is still the same. But the path that we take on this journey has just changed. It's not about Jesus carrying us. It's about 
about how we can learn from Jesus and how we can carry others introducing them to Jesus so they can carry others. It's kind of a complicated race. God and our son. Who's going to win? Who's going to reach that generation? The more we have on our team, the more God gets to see independence. Food for thought? I invite you now, if you are able, to stand, join with us in our closing song, Freely, Freely. Jesus has been given all power and authority over the heavens and earth. And we can't wait to share some of that power and authority with his disciples. You. Me. Yeah. So what makes us a disciple? What have we learned from Jesus that Jesus expects us to pass on to others? Besides, God loves you. And we love you. There's so much more to the story. What is it you have learned? How can you share it with others? Food for thought.